now. So lovely to see you all. It's been so great to see how eager you have been for this uh, Bible study, Women's Bible Study. Um, I had people ring in and text me last week, Reverend Taylor, what time is it starting today? And I said, no, it's next week, not this week. So we're so glad that people are so eager to get into the word of God. And we're just delighted to have um, Pamela with us to lead us in our Bible study. We just love you, Pamela, as I keep telling you. Thank you. <laughs> and it's true, we do. And we just thank God for this period in our lives where God's connected us and we can have these times of fellowship and uh, around the word of God. So I'm going to open in prayer and then I'm going to... Um, turn over to Pamela and um, Clint would um, let people in as they're coming in after we begin. We want to thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity again of being together and to be able to read your word and study your word together and to see what you will say to us. Lord, we have ears that are open to hear your voice as you lead and direct in your way. Well, thank you for the age in which we're living in, because had we been in earlier years, we wouldn't have this opportunity. We wouldn't know about Zoom. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to connect with Israel without having to pay a fare to get here. So although it may seem like negative circumstances around us, you're doing a very real and wonderful work, and we are so excited. So we commend ourselves to you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you will have your way. We submit to your guidance. We just thank you so much for our dear, wonderful sister Pamela, all the way in Israel, Jerusalem, and yet in our homes on Zoom. <laughs> we thank you for this wonderful technology. So we look yeah. forward to what you will say to us yeah. through her. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Lovely to see you all again. More people coming in. God bless you. Well, you. good evening from Jerusalem. <laughs> and uh, it's just the light is fading outside, uh, which means that the three stars will appear in the sky and it will become a new week. Wonderful. So, yes, so we wish each other Shavua Tov, which Shavua. means may you have a good week. So uh, remember the believers in when we read in Acts of the Apostles, they met on the first day of the week. And the day begins in the evening with the sun going down and the stars coming in the sky. That's the beginning of the new day. So believers would meet on what we know as Saturday night, which is the first day of the week. It's not Saturday. It's already Sunday. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, I'm so glad that you thank the Lord for the technology because uh, it really is a gift. Uh, to us and we have been able to fellowship with one another uh, not only here in this bible study but also with the round table mm -hmm. and it's just wonderful that we have this uh, weekly connection a monthly connection uh, it's just really a gift mm -hmm. you know because before we would see each other maybe once a year that's right <laughs> So I'm thrilled. I really am. And I really do thank the Lord for, for Zoom. It's a, a real gift to the body of Christ to, to be built up and to, um, to progress, to move forward, and to follow the Lord. So we are in the Gospel of John. And we are in Chapter 2. And a couple of opening words about uh, our read, this specific reading of John between all of you in London and me in Jerusalem, that we're reading 
through the eyes of a Jewish person in the first century. That's how we're reading John um, together. So it's a little bit unique and um, you may not find this particular kind of perspective in a commentary, in a Christian commentary or a commentary on John uh, because of the fact that Israel, uh, the rebirth of the state of Israel is so new. You know, we're, we're about to turn 73 years old mm -hmm. as a state. And that's not, that's very young for a nation, a reborn nation uh, back in her own land. And all the research that has taken place in 73 years in archaeology and with the language and with ancient literature, uh, it opens up a whole new perspective on things. And so today I'm going to introduce a little bit of archaeology to help to illustrate uh, some, some of the points that we're going to address. So, Esther Rosemary, <laughs> please, why don't you begin by reading the first four verses and we'll begin to discuss. Okay. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Okay, now, it's interesting, I checked in a commentary about this, uh, the beginning, the first verse, and they were going on and on and on, um, circling and circling back and circling over and around and around, trying to explain the third day. It's very simple. Uh, as I mentioned, we're entering into the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the second day is Monday, and the third day is Tuesday. That's the third day. Very simple. Now, what John did here was very deliberate. He said, on the third day, there was a wedding. Third day wedding. Now, in modern Jewish tradition, uh, Jewish weddings take place on a Tuesday. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of what is written in the book of Exodus. So we want to go to Exodus 19, and there we will read about the wedding between God and the newly born nation of Israel. And we'll probably do it again and go into some depth when we uh, do it at the round table, but I do want to introduce it here. And you're going to understand that uh, the wedding and the third day come together in this chapter. So uh, first of all, let's turn to Exodus chapter, chapter 19 and let's read the first verse. Oh yeah. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so notice that it's even interesting that it's the third month, uh, the third month of the new year. Now the new year for uh, the Jewish or the Hebrew calendar is uh, just begun. In fact, I think we're around the 10th day of the first month of the year, if I'm not mistaken. Let me get my, my uh, Hebrew calendar here. And uh, let's see, it's the 20th. Okay, it's actually the seventh. It's the seventh day 
of the very first month of the Hebrew calendar. And that means we just celebrated New Year seven days ago. According to the biblical calendar, it begins on the first of Nisan. And then on the 10th of Nisan, uh, in terms of remembering the Passover, and we'll be talking about this um, on Thursday when we gather at the round table, uh, on the 10th of the month of this month of Nisan, which is in three days, uh, every Hebrew family was to take a young lamb without blemish and bring it into their household. And then on the 14th of Nisan, which is Passover, that little adorable, sweet, non-blemished lamb is going to be slaughtered and barbecued and eaten uh, as part of the Passover uh, remembrance meal. Uh, now, we don't do that uh, nowadays. Um, most people have an entirely different menu uh, for the Passover meal, but that was the biblical commandment uh, in those days. Okay, so Israel has gone through the Passover and they have crossed the Red Sea and they've entered the wilderness. And in Exodus 19, they arrive in the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, so, and they, <clears throat> they set up their tents and they camp. <clears throat> so, I'm in a, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm switched into my New King James Bible and out of my Hebrew Bible. So, I'm, you know, it's, it's funny how you, when you read, you go to the right when you're reading in English and then <laughs> the left when you're reading in Hebrew. Okay, so they come and they camp in the wilderness before the mountain, it says. And then Moses goes up to God. Now, um, we're remembering, oh, okay, this is where Moses met the Lord in the first place. This is where he meets him um, at the burning bush, at the snake, most likely because it says the mountain. It's not a mountain, it's the mountain. So he goes up to God and he calls uh, to him. And then the Lord speaks uh, to him in verse four. And so, uh, let's see, uh, read verse four, four, five, and six. Of chapter 19. Yes, we're, we're just in chapter 19. That's it. You have seen that I, um, what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So here, this is the marriage proposal right here. The Lord says... Uh, if, you, if you will obey my voice, that means you have to listen to his voice, obey, and then keep my covenant. And that says, you shall be a special treasure. In Hebrew, am segula, a, a, a treasured people, like a bride, that God is going to regard Israel uh, as his bride. And we read about that all the time in the prophets. Uh, if, if you look at pro the prophet Hosea, for instance, or in Ezekiel 16, uh, different places, Israel is referred to as God's bride. And so here he is calling um, Israel as a special treasure to me above all people, meaning uh, he's taking Israel to himself like a bride, and uh, he's not going to marry anybody else but this one, this 
particular uh, group, this nation. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So that describes a kind of service, a holy nation, which means set apart. Uh, and so then uh, Moses comes down and he talks to the elders. And in verse eight, read that, Rosemary, please. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Okay, so uh, the Lord makes the proposal and the people say, yes, we will do. We will do what we hear, what the Lord commands us. Okay, so then Moses goes back to the Lord. And then here we have the preparation for the wedding, nine, uh, verses 9 and 10 and 11. Well, let's see, 9 through, whoops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Keep turning the page and I shouldn't. <laughs> 9, yeah, read 9, 10, 11, and 12. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. We shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Okay, so the Lord is number one, telling Israel how to prepare for this great moment where this covenant is going to be sealed, uh, this wedding covenant. And this is how um, in, um, I would say, in some circles of rabbinic Judaism that really stick to the word, they believe this is a marriage covenant. Um, based on, of course, what the prophets have said that describe this moment of the people Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. Um, and so the preparation is the washing of clothes and bathing. And so as it is today in modern Jewish weddings, there is always a full immersion in a, a, what we call a mikvah which is a special, uh, like a little pool, and you full, fully immerse, like baptism. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course, in modern Orthodox Judaism, they, they immerse for several different occasions. But before a wedding, the bride always goes through a ritual immersion, which we call a mikvah. So, and it's based on these scriptures. Wow. Okay, so um, read 14 and 15. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready on the third day, do not come near your wives. Okay, so everybody was supposed to remain pure uh, before this great third day. Mm -hmm. And now we, we quickly go over to Cana of Galilee. And this is what the bride and the groom had to do before the great, their great wedding day when Jesus came to their um, wedding is that they would have to go through this um, purification and ritual washing. So do you have any comments or thoughts no, I just, at this point? I, I was just thinking to myself, you were speaking, it's, um, it's like types and shadows. You have, you have the, um, the shadow of what's to come in the New Testament. So John is pointing the people back 
as you said, you know, in previous studies to the Old Testament, there's, there's this connection. Yes. So the people are going to understand clearly what's going on. Right, exactly. So when uh, a typical first century, well, okay, that the John was written uh, a little bit later, but a, a Jewish person reading this in the same time period, um, they would go, ah, mm. ah, you know, it's Exodus. <laughs> All yes. right. Which we, okay. we don't know. Yes, we don't know. But from the Jewish tradition, they will know. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, now let's read about the sign and the wonder. So verse 16, 17, 18, 19... Uh, okay, at to the end of 19. So it would be 16 through the end of 19. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thundering and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Oh, this is amazing. So. These are signs and wonders. These are new signs and wonders that the people of Israel are experiencing on this day. They've seen the Red Sea parted. They've seen the 10 plagues in Egypt. And now they're seeing this mountain mm -hmm. rumbling and great blasts of trumpets and fire and lightning and thunder so it's a very dramatic sign and wonder for them to mark the day that they are entering into a wedding covenant with god okay so um let's just read um right down to the end of the chapter then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Also the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, away, get down and then come up, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. This is amazing. So this is the first time where the Lord is laying out parameters. Mm -hmm. He is defining a, a space where he is going to be for them. And they are going to be in another space and they cannot cross that line. And this is actually the, the beginning of how God defines the worship space which later becomes the tabernacle which later becomes the temple where he's going to dwell in the midst of israel so it's it's really interesting that he begins it at mount sinai and this is how um, he begins to define the relationship and then he follows it of course exodus 20 are the 10 commandments and that's kind of like the wedding contract you know you're going to, these, this is what you must keep if you're going to be my people. So um, that will deal with at the round table at the right time. 
but uh, just know that <laughs> Exodus 20 is like the wedding contract. So getting back to John, uh, John chapter 2, uh, you know, we're hardly into the very first verse, and we're, we've already been taken to Mount Sinai. That's how dramatic this chapter is. Of course, every chapter in John is dramatic in one way or another, but for him to say, on the third day, and immediately everybody goes, oh my goodness, what's going to be happening in Cana? You know, what kind of event are we going to experience in this wedding? Okay, because uh, he says third day and wedding. Okay, so uh, then uh, it we get down really down to earth. This is really interesting because we go from the heights of Mount Sinai and these great and dramatic signs and wonders, and then we come plunging down to earth in Cana of Galilee, where the mother of Jesus comes to him. She says, they have no wine. You know, so they've run out of, they've been drinking all this time and they ran out of their wine. Okay. And then Jesus says to her in the most earthly manner you can possibly imagine, he says, ma ech patlach, you know, Hahutza, that's uh, Hebrew for um, what does it matter to you out of here? You know, leave me alone. <laughs> it's, it's so funny because we're coming from this dramatic moment on Sinai. John takes us up to the top of Sinai or takes us to the base of Sinai. And now we're in Cana and we're telling our mother to... to to leave it's not time leave me alone <laughs> anyway but she this this mother the mother of our lord she mm -hmm. is a very very first of all she's been holding all these things in her heart about what she's heard from different people who are prophesying to her and everything that had taken place from the time that he was born. And uh, so she goes to the servants and she says, whatever he says, do it. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Good Jewish mother. <laughs> okay, so now we're coming to the next uh, section of this chapter. And it's really interesting. The chapter is divided equally into two parts. And then there's this little uh, one verse that separates the two parts, uh, which I'll get to later on. But we're now in um, another part of the first part of the chapter. And uh, this is all going to be about uh, the water and the wine and the water pots. And it's very interesting that John should mention a bunch of storage pots. You know, what's the big deal about the storage pots, the water pots of stone? What are we talking about here? What's, uh, what's the deal? So, um, Clint, I'd love to have the pictures now because I'm going to show you some of the stone vessels. Um, right here you see a beautiful stone cup on the left. These are all from around the time of Jesus because this is what they used. And then there, here's a little drinking cup to the right on your screen. Um, let's look at the next slide. Okay, now this, oh, thank you for doing, <laughs> he fixed it up so nicely. This is actually a clay jar, but what it held were scrolls of God's word. That's how they, you didn't have books like we have today where, you know, all the pages are sewn into a codex. Um, you had, Every book of the Bible was a scroll and it was rolled up and then it was 
stored in a clay jar like this one. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Now, these are really interesting. Uh, these are ink wells. And those were mainly used by the priests who were scribes. And they used these to copy the word of the Lord. Because they, were, uh, because they didn't have a printing press, they were constantly copying the books of the Bible. And this required a tremendous amount of discipline to be able to copy from one scroll to another without making any mistakes. And mind you, they were writing with uh, pens that were carved out of uh, reeds, uh, marsh reeds that you uh, would find down at the Dead Sea. And then they were dipped into this ink, which was um, uh, charcoal from grapevines mixed with a little bit of resin uh, to make the ink. And then they wrote on goat skins, the skins of goats that were sacrificed in the temple. So uh, you could not make a mistake because there was no, uh, I have, I use, um, I do a lot of copying. And so I use this white out, this, uh, <laughs> that you <laughs> simply go over the ink uh, and no pencil erasers or anything like that. You had to be perfect. So it required really a lot of discipline and nobody had glasses and they did it by the light of an oil lamp. So you can imagine the rigor that was involved in copying a book of the Bible. So these are very special, the ink wells and what they represent. Uh, let's look at the next slide here. Okay, this is one of the stone jars probably not the one at Cana, but this is what they look like. And so the water uh, was in the jar. Uh, it was stored in there to about 20 or 30, how does it say in here? Uh, 20 or 30 gallons a piece in the uh, New King James uh, could go into one of these jars, stone jars. Okay, and then I, th I believe the next picture is a glass pitcher. And I'm going to explain why I include this in, but this is also from first century, very beautiful uh, handwork um, on glass, Roman glass. Um, and that was used to pour out beverages into uh, drinking cups. And then let's see, I think it's the last, yeah, this is the last slide. Now, this is a table made out of stone. And I'll, t I'll explain why it's made out of stone. And then you have the two water jugs underneath the table. So we can kind of picture how the jugs were set up or the jars, the stone jars were set up um, in the house uh, during the wedding. They were all kind of lined up and probably there were tables because the, you see the, the table actually protects uh, the water from things falling into the water. It functions as a kind of roof. Now, this particular uh, table and jars is found in a priestly home in Jerusalem that existed in the time of Jesus. And it was buried in the fires uh, when Jer Jerusalem was pretty much destroyed, where the upper city, where the priests lived, where it burnt in uh, 70 AD, when also the temple was destroyed by the Roman armies. And uh, the reason why priests had everything in stone is because, and John mentions it, he mentions it in the um, Verse six, it says, water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews. And I want to explain that because uh, by the first century or by the time of Jesus, 
um, <clears throat> the uh, Jewish law required um, a purification process that, okay, included ritual immersion, like I described, uh, before a wedding and before other occasions, before the Shabbat. And the other was that if a vessel was defiled, like if a fly flew into a vessel of water or wine or oil or in any ways, something like that, if the vessel was clay, you would have to take the vessel and throw it away immediately. There was no washing it or cleaning it. You simply threw it out the door of your house. And that's why we find so many of these clay pieces everywhere. If you come to Israel and you walk through an archeological site, like in Caesarea, you see little bits of clay everywhere. Th those are actually from roofs, but if you come around a Jewish site and you find clay bits, those are from pots that were no longer um, fit to be used, no longer ritually clean. Stone, however, you could clean again. And that's why households had many stone vessels. Uh, and in this case, in Cana, the water jugs are made out of stone and all the other storage jugs as well to make sure that they would be able to be cleaned over and over again. So that was part of, uh, I would say, rabbinic law at the time, the law of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so pretty much everybody who was an Israelite or a Judean um, had those stone vessels. Now, I'm, I'll stop for a sec in case you want to ask a question or share a thought. Um, not really. <clears throat> okay, I, I want to share a couple scriptures from Paul because he mentions vessels. And you've, you're very familiar with the uh, teaching on the vessels of honor and the vessels of wrath. Yeah. Okay, so let's revisit it in light of what we now understand and think about the, the vessels that you've seen in the pictures. You've seen a drinking cup, two drinking cups. You've seen uh, storage jars. Uh, you've seen a container for the word of God. You've seen ink wells, and you've seen a beautiful glass pitcher. So let's go to Romans 9. And let's just revisit this uh, verse in light of what we've seen. Um, it's uh, Romans 9 and 22, I believe. Yes. Uh, it's 22 and 23, but actually I like to do 21 too. So can you read 21, 22, and 23 of Romans 9? Yeah. Does not the potter have power over the clay? from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Okay, so um, now when we think of a vessel of honor, uh, we can include, um, aside from clay vessels, and in, in, in another, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul uh, talks about the treasures found in earthen vessels. 
but think of these stone vessels as vessels of honor because they can be purified they can be washed they can be purified and they're used for honorable purposes mm -hmm. storage of water um, the inkwell for the writing of the word of god the uh, now the clay pot for the storage of the word of god the pitcher for the pouring of a beverage and um, and so forth drinking cups and so forth think of those in the first century context when paul is writing this he's thinking of the shapes and different uses for vessels of honor and vessels of mercy um, because of course that's they had many different kinds of vessels and the vessels of wrath of course were vessels that had to be thrown away because they were no longer ritually clean they could no longer be used so does that help to illustrate that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I think it, it kind of uh, rung home for me because uh, I guess when I first heard that teaching, which was a, a long time ago, mm. um, I was thinking of, you know, a golden or a silver vessel. Now those were used in the temple and uh, in, according to uh, Jewish law, those things were found in the temple. But in the priestly houses, even those who served in the temple, they had stone vessels. And then they, of course, they had beautiful glass as well. So uh, that's really interesting that John makes a point um, to, to mention that the water is sitting in these stone vessels and by the way, making them, uh, most of the manufacture of stone vessels took place up here in Jerusalem. Um, around in the city, they found a few of the places where they manufactured them. And they had lathes. They would take a stone and just simply run it down the lathe and then it would make a, um, the inner part of it and then they would carve the outer part. Uh, so they had all manner of ways of making the vessels and it usually took place in a kind of a cave because they had all the stone right here all they had to do is just quarry right out of the your backyard to to make uh, your dishes your stoneware <laughs> so that's another thing i wanted to share with you okay so um let's read on seven eight Yeah, let's let's uh, do. Let's read seven through ten. Okay. Then Je uh, Jesus said to them, "Fill the water pots with water," and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, "Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast." And they took it. And when the marsh of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the marsh of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to them, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests are well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Okay. Now, think about it. The wedding guests have already been drinking and they are, let's say, their uh, level of observation and perception is a little bit distorted as a result of the wine that they've drunk. I'm not saying that they're drunk, but possibly they are. <laughs> <laughs> tipsy yes uh and so they're not going to be noticing this strange occurrence but the servants yeah. it's this sign is actually um jesus directs this sign to the servants 
they're the ones that see it because they're the ones that fill up the jars with water. And then they're the ones that draw it out and then they take it to the master of the feast, who's kind of like the, uh, um, like the head butler, mm-hmm. you know, like in Downton Abbey or something. <laughs> so, uh, and he, he's saying, wait a minute, this is the best wine. What's going on here? And so then he calls the bridegroom and he says, what did you do? You've, you, you've uh, put out the best wine. What did you serve them before? Well, what's going on here? So um, the sign um, in verse 11, this is the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay, so the servants and the disciples and of course his mother and the head of the feast, the, the main, um, what would you call him? Overseer. Maitre d', the yeah. maitre d of the feast. <clears throat> They're the ones that see the sign. The other, the guests, they don't see it because they're, as you say, they're, they're pretty much uh, involved in the wedding feast by now. And, uh, but this is a whole crew of people that are sober because they're serving and uh, they're going to pass the word around. They're going to be start speaking about this uh, throughout the village and then it will spread and it will spread uh, around the region because uh, Cana, I think most of us have been either through Cana or by Cana or in Cana. And it was once upon a time, a little Jewish village uh, with many villages all around that area. And so the word would have gone out. And so interesting. Now let's think back to uh, Sinai again. The big dramatic sign and wonder that takes place in Exodus 19 to demonstrate God's glory that Israel is going to be marrying uh, this God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, and Jacob, the God of the burning bush, of Moses, of the 10 plagues, and the, the parting of the Red Sea, and the pillar of cloud, and the pillar of fire. Here uh, we have the first sign of kind of like the new, the new wedding, the yeah. wedding uh, in the time of Jesus. And it begins with the beverage, with the wine with the jars it's like a really earthly subtle kind of miracle Mm -hmm. and sign and uh, the first people to experience the sign are the number one the disciples and secondly the servants so uh before we move on because we're going to uh there these two the the verse 12 is going to kind of be like where we change over to the next uh the next event um do you have anything you want to share any thoughts any um ponderings yeah this this, um miracle is as you said just as mother disciples the servants see it but it's it's like it's a um providing a platform a foundation for these new disciples faith Yes. It's, it's like, you know, they, they get to know who he is. It's very quiet. As you said, not everybody knows what happened. Just these kind of intimate few. But it's like a strengthening, a, a platform for the faith of the disciples. This, they, they're getting a, a glimpse at the glory of Jesus. It's like an unveiling of this glory. Whereas yes. in Sinai, the people see the glory of God, the, the yes. trumpets and the smoke. And, but here, it's, it's very kind of almost subtle. Yes. 
people. They're getting to see the glory. Mary is beginning to discover through the miracle who her son is. Yes. It's very kind of subtle. <laughs> yes, it, it's subtle and it's intimate. Very intimate, yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting that John would say the third day and a wedding because then it takes us to this grand miracle. It's the same God, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same God yes, doing fact. a subtle yeah. miracle, a new kind of perspective or something. Yes. Another thing, I think something that really touches me, uh, I don't know, you know, when, when you, there's a big banquet, like a big feast. I, I remember those beautiful feasts after the uh, women's conferences, you know, the final feast. What did you call the a banquet? Oh, yeah, the you banquet. Know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have them here and um, I'm, I'm usually caught being the one uh, in the kitchen serving it and cooking and cleaning and, you know, plating and whatever. And so there's always like a, a team of people that work, you know, to, we all work together and we're all sort of talking with one another quietly while everybody is sitting at the tables, you know, and then, uh, you know, and then we're bringing the food out and serving and, and so forth. So I love thinking about the servants and their reaction among, uh, did you see that? Am I blind? Am I crazy? Seeing, wait a minute, we just filled those with water. We filled with water and now it's wine. What do we do? It's wine ever. Conditions <laughs> changed. We've served the best last. Yes. Can you believe it? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> So I love it. I love it that the Lord chooses these people to get the first sign. I just love it. And of course, the disciples, they're probably all involved with the servants too. They're saying, well, you know, <laughs> he's special. Keep your eyes on him. <laughs> yeah, right. He knows what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you've got to follow this man. He's amazing. <laughs> right. So this is uh, this is the wedding at Cana. It's big, but it's very very intimate. Yeah. The sign is really intimate and really special and really targeted to one type of people. It's it's yeah. just brilliant. It's wonderful. So here comes this one verse, and it and this kind of. If you know the topography of the land, this is a, a, a big drop because Nazareth is way above sea level and Capernaum is way below sea level. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a, a descent uh, down to Capernaum. So uh, in this verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, his disciples, and probably some of those servants too, because they were so, and, uh, and they did not stay there many days. Now, here's something. Okay, so he went down uh, with his, I guess, uh, the 12 and his mother, and they came to Capernaum, and then they had to spend the night, probably. You know, you don't just get to Capernaum from uh, Cana in, in a couple of hours if you're walking it's pretty much a full day of uh, traveling on foot, uh, going down through the wadis, down through the Valley of the Doves, Wadi Hammam, it comes out right near uh, Kibbutz Genosar, Mag Magdala, that area. And then of course, another good hour of walking, oh, maybe an hour and a half to Capernaum. So. Uh, they would have to spend the night. So there are quite a, a number of people. And the only way they can spend the night, and I mentioned, I think we were talking about Jesus' birth um, in uh, chapter one, the kataluma, the guest room. Yeah. So uh, they, they probably would have to stay in a number of guest rooms to get everybody all fit into town. So it was kind of a big visit. And uh, another mention here, it says, they did not stay there many days. 
Now, there is a document, an early Christian document called the Didache. Do you know that document? Didache. Not sure. uh, I, maybe it's pronounced differently. Um, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Didache. It's an early Christian document. And in that document, it says that a prophet must never spend in a household more than um, three days mm. or he becomes a false prophet wow. okay yeah so he uh, there would i think there was already a kind of tradition uh, established that you did not uh, sort of hang out for a very long time when you were staying in the guest room however uh, we know that because he, be, he actually, that's his, that's his base camp for all of his ministry in the Galilee. He does stay, and he stays with one of the disciples' mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, in her home. So he actually gets to stay in the guest room once he's established. So this is showing us, okay, they're going down to the base camp, um, but they don't stay very long. So maybe that's because, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely speculating at this point. <laughs> but I, do, I'm, I am aware that in the Didache, if you, you're not connected with the family in any way and you're passing through a town or you're visiting, you only stay three days and then you go. That's it. <clears throat> okay. Now we completely switch to a whole new place yeah we're going up to jerusalem and it's passover mm -hmm. so uh we're leaving the little jewish village of cana in galilee and we're going up to jerusalem so begin reading uh this is verse 13 uh let's see Verse 13 to the end of 17. Now the past of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, the changes money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Okay, so here we go. We, there's really a lot of material here. First of all, we've got Passover. Mm -hmm. And second of all, we've got the temple and what's going on at this particular time in the temple. So uh, moving on, we have um, number one, pilgrimage up to the temple. So we're going to again go to uh, Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. Three times a year, all your males should appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. Okay, now this is the law, and so Every three times a year, every Israelite male was required 
to go up to Jerusalem, to the house of the Lord, and bring a sacrifice, uh, depending upon what the situation was and what the budget was. Now, if you were traveling, uh, say, from the area of Syria today, or even from Mesopotamia, or from Turkey, because by this time there was a Jewish diaspora as a result of the uh, deportations back uh, in 586 BC. And so you had Jewish communities all over in, in the mountains of Southeast Turkey, Northeast Syria, and uh, also uh, along the rivers between the Euphrates and the Tigris. And then you had also Jews, um, Jewish communities in the south, like in Ethiopia and, and so forth. So uh, the, tre the trekking was a long trek and they would, oh, coming up from Egypt, a large Jewish community in Egypt, and uh, the, there were camel caravans. Um, and these caravanners uh, were the ones to um, create a secure means to journey up to Jerusalem. And they would travel on the uh, trade routes. And so to practically bring, like if you were thinking that you were going to sacrifice an ox, you would probably not want to bring the ox from Syria because that's a long way for that animal to travel without getting injured mm -hmm. or a sheep, a ram or, or a lamb uh, or a goat. Um, even from Galilee, this is a little bit impractical. And so what happened was the uh, those who were in charge of the temple, the Sadducees, the priesthood, uh, set up like a market um, around the temple, uh, the southern steps of the temple area to, to the right, there was a market, not to the right, but to um, the western side of the, that area. Uh, there was a, a large market where they would sell the animals because they had to be unblemished and they had to be healthy and not scrawny uh, and uh, they were clean and everything. And then the other thing was they had to change their money, their currency to the temple coin. And that, so it was necessary to have money changers. The problem was, is they moved, most likely they moved the market upstairs for more convenience. And they had it in the Southern part called the Royal Stoa, which is a very, very large hall with columns that was open, but it was close to the temple. And it created a racket that would have interfered with all the worship, with the singing of the Levites, because they are singing the Psalms 24 seven on the steps uh, leading up to the court of the Israelites. So this animal market and the money changers, there was a lot of shouting and a lot of noise from the animals and a lot of bargaining and negotiating going on. And so it created this brouhaha <laughs> and uh, that really, really was a disruption. Now, uh, I, I, am, I don't read anywhere where the market actually moved within the uh, past the uh, court of the Gentiles. It was in the court of the Gentiles, which is close enough to the temple. Uh, but once you cross the uh, wall of partition that divided the court of the Gentiles to the temple complex, then you came into the court of the women and you had other things going on in there. Um, for instance, you had um, the, the four chambers that were uh, run by the priests, there was one for the lepers. When you got cleansed as a leper, you came to the priest and you presented yourself. Remember when Jesus heals the lepers, 
he, uh, he says, go and present yourself to the priest. That means go up to Jerusalem, go to the chamber of the lepers and present yourself. Then there were those like Paul, when he fulfilled his Nazarite uh, vow, he would go to the chamber of the Nazarites. That's another chamber that was inside the court of the women. Then you had a chamber for uh, the wood, for the altar. So there was a priest in there managing all the wood because they had to constantly bring it in. And they had Levites uh, carrying the wood. And then you had a chamber for the oils and the incense. Um, so the incense for the altar and oils for the anointing and the frankincense and all of that. So they had four of these different chambers within the court of the women. Now the court of the women is where Jesus was uh, presented when he was born uh, on the eighth day, I believe it was Mary, uh, Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple, which was the court of the women because they couldn't go beyond that into the court of the Israelites. But in the court of the women, you also had this round uh, staircase that went up to the gate that went into the court of the Israelites where they were offering the sacrifices on the bronze altar and so forth. There you had Levites standing 24 seven and singing the Psalms, cycles of the Psalms over and over again. Okay, so you had constant worship going on in the temple. You never stopped. There was never a, a pause. It was constant worship. And uh, so you had all that singing going on and worship and then you had these four chambers and then you had people like Mary bringing their baby into the court to present them uh, on the eighth day. Okay, and most likely there was circumcision, you know, for the boys and so forth. Uh, outside of the court of the women, outside of the wall of partition you had on the eastern side, Solomon's portico, that's where Jesus in John chapter 10, we'll meet him in that portico. So we will see that portico later on. But anyway, that's just to give you kind of an ambience of the temple and why he had to be driving that market out of there. And, uh, and then it's interesting because in Zechariah chapter 14, uh, we in the very last, it's the very, actually the very last verse of Zechariah, of the book of Zechariah, 1421, it says, yes, every pot in Jerusalem, here's, here's vessel, every <clears throat> pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook them. In that day, there shall no longer be a Canaanite. Now, they call it um, a Canaanite, but it means a merchant, someone who is selling in the house of the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that uh, means someone who's trading, who's, yeah. you know, negotiating. So that's uh, where it's mentioned. And then, of course, uh, the, the actual uh, quote from Psalm 69, which is zeal for my house has consumed me or has eaten me up. Um, that is in uh, Psalm 69. Where, where did I put it? Never mind. It's uh, 6911, I think. It's 99 because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Psalm uh, 699. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So that is actually a messianic prophecy right there. Okay. So that is the business of going up to the temple and dealing with the agora or the animal market, which was not supposed to be up there. Mm in the uh, portico, but it was supposed to be down uh, 
on the main street down below, which would have been, uh, it was just less convenient for the pilgrims because they would have to bring the animals probably around and, and so forth to get them up to the court of the Israelites. Okay, uh, let's go back. Now, uh, so here we come, and now we're going to have a confrontation. And I have to um, clarify about this confrontation. So read uh, 18, 19, and 20, and 21. OK, so. <clears throat> The Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Okay, now there's really a lot of material um, in this particular passage. Number one, uh, John mentions the Judaios, okay, the Jews. Now, that's something that we have to discuss because uh, this is where the term is first used. It's actually introduced into Israelite vocabulary when um, the people of Judah who were in exile in Babylon with the destruction of the first temple in 586 AD, I mean B BC, sorry, BC. Um, when they return, they are under Persian rule. Uh, Babylon, the empire of Babylon has fallen and it is now under Persian rule. That happens in Daniel. And uh, so the Persians rename uh, when they send back the people from exile back to Jerusalem, uh, there is a governor appointed to rule over the district. So this becomes a Persian district and they call it um, Judea, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is going to be 515 BC where uh, between 539, which is the rise of uh, Cyrus, the decree of Cyrus. Then we have the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And there, then there is a return uh, from exile in Babylon to rebuild the temple. There's been a decree given by Cyrus to rebuild the temple and then to uh, resettle the province or the district of that they now call Judea. Now, before this area, this district was known as the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin before the destruction of the first temple, because this was the allotted tribal territory given when the people Israel crossed over the Jordan River from their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness under Joshua, they cross uh, under Joshua and Caleb. By this time, you know, we've gone through several books of the Bible. <laughs> you know, we've uh, gone through Joshua, Judges, and First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings, and then comes the destruction of the first temple, and then there is the exile to Babylon. You have all the prophets. Jeremiah is, is a, a prophet in this time. And then you have, after 70 years, there is the decree of Cyrus 
And then you have the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. Of course, you have the book of Daniel, which is straddling uh, both uh, times. And you have also the prophet Ezekiel. So um, those people return and they become Judeans. Mm -hmm. And in Greek, later on with the conquest of Alexander the Great, uh, in Greek, it's called Eudaios. And in English, it's translated Jews. So in terms of the people Israel who came out of Egypt, they were known as the Hebrews. And that word Hebrew comes from the word avar. Now, um, in Hebrew, Hebrews means Ivrim. E and you can hear the root in there, it's avar. Avar means to cross over. Okay. And that is when Jacob, when he was returning from uh, um, his uh, uncle Laban, he came from Mesopotamia. He came from Mesopotamia over to the eastern um, part of the Jordan. He had the encounter with Laban. Then he struggled with the angel. He got the new name Israel. And then he crossed over the Jordan with the 11 sons. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. that's where they get the name Ivri or Hebrew. Okay. They crossed over. <clears throat> so they're living in the land and then they end up in Egypt through yeah. Joseph, etc. And so they're Hebrew. They're still called Hebrews in Egypt. And then when they come out and they come to, to Sinai and they have this wedding covenantal ceremony, they become the people Israel. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then when they get to the land, then they're parceled off in their 12 tribes. Yeah. And then when they go to Babylon, you have... Uh, no, before they go to Babylon, there's a split in the kingdom after Solomon. And the northern kingdom are called the kingdom of Israel. And the southern, they're called the kingdom of Judah. Judea, yeah. Then the exile, and then they come back, and then they're called Judeans. So in John, what John is saying here is he's talking about the religious leadership in the district of Judea, because it was different than the district of Galilea, which is Galilee. Yeah. So those who lived, this is quite confusing, actually, those who lived in Galilee were called Galileans. Yeah. Uh, and they were called Israelites. Remember, Jesus uh, says to Nathaniel, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Yeah. But if you come down to, or if you come up to Jerusalem, here is where you have the concentration of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're ruling. They are the religious ruling party, and they are called Eudaios. John calls them Eudaios. So it does not mean the Jewish people in a general way. It means specifically the leadership. So uh, when we hear the word Jew in John, we are talking about religious leadership in Jerusalem. So because uh, here, I'm sorry to confuse everybody. You, you can ask all the questions you want afterwards. <laughs> it, it's quite confusing to see the kind of the how the names sort of evolved through history. So they're saying these, rel the religious leadership, they're saying, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? You know, so they are really being very cynical when they are addressing Jesus after he's driven out the market. Okay, so this is a very sort of, I'm trying to help you to understand the, the attitude of these, 
these, imagine all these priests standing well, around. You yeah, know. Well, they saw themselves as the um, the guardians of the faith. Yes. So yeah, this exactly. man, come on, what's your credentials? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and so it's a very cynical comment. And then Jesus answers and he said to them, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. He's yeah. talking, of course, about his own body. And he knows full well that they are going to be the ones to lead him to, uh, to orchestrate yeah. his way to the cross. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this is interesting. Verse 20. There's a whole backstory to this. Um, why don't you read it? The verse 20. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Okay, now let's do the math. Uh, <clears throat> for, it has taken 46. They're right. It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Now, but they didn't build the temple from scratch. This is what happened. Cyrus makes the decree in 539. This is in the book of Ezra, beginning of the book of Ezra. In fact, we could even go there. If I can find it in my English Bible. <laughs> And we can just read, read about the, um, the decree. Uh, it's just the first, um, first four verses. Let's read the first four verses. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Ezra, what chapter? Uh, chapter one. First four verses. It's the beginning of Ezra. Oh, yeah. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? That's a question. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of this, his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing that he is so specific about geographically pointing out that the house of the Lord is to be in Jerusalem? Yeah. This is a Gentile king, and, and uh, his uh, leadership, his kingship, uh, he was considered like Pharaoh to be like a divine figure over this massive empire. And it certainly was bigger than the Egyptian empire. Uh, it went all the way <clears throat> uh, eastward into uh, all of Iran and part of Afghanistan and all of Turkey. And then of course, uh, it extended, the Persian empire extended into North Africa. And, uh, and then of course, all the area which we call, uh, 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 it's uh, Syrophoenicia, which is Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, um, Israel today and so forth. So it was a massive kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he even points out, he says, uh, Judah, which is how it's pronounced in, in English, but he is uh, calling the district Judea. 
you know, this is a renamed province and uh, the person who rules over the province is a governor or a satrap. So he is making the decree, the people um, who belong in Jerusalem, those exilees, they are to return to Jerusalem and build, rebuild the house of God. And that was the policy of the Persians uh, when Cyrus uh, rose to power, uh, was uh, wherever a people had been conquered by the Persians, they were to rebuild their temples. So it, that was the common policy. And so he's making this decree having really, I mean, he doesn't understand that he's being used by God to uh, bring the Jewish people back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the house of the Lord, which is very, very important. And so 539 BC is the beginning of what we call second temple period. And it goes right on up to 70 AD when the temple is destroyed. And so it's in this period that we have also the whole gospel period, the whole time of Jesus and before Jesus and so forth. So a massive amount of history between 539 and 70 AD, which as a result of this decree of Cyrus. Okay, <clears throat> now, 46 years. All right, so <clears throat> Herod the Great, do we all know who Herod the Great is? Yes, he is the uh, king. He's actually referred to as the king of Judea. Mm -hmm. Or uh, when it's translated into English, it's the king of the Jews. So he is the king of Judea. And uh, he has uh, sons. Uh, uh, Herod Antipas, of course, was ruling over Galilee, and then Philip was ruling over the district to the north of Galilee, around uh, the Mount Hermon area, the base of Hermon, and uh, the springs there, um, the Mount Hermon Springs, which is known as Banyas, and then there was uh, another son named Archelaus, and then a daughter. <clears throat> So Herod is ruling in Jerusalem, and he's, um, he's a very complicated man, and he's a very ambitious ruler, and he actually had, he's a very wealthy ruler because he inherits a lot of property from Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. He inherits these plantations around Jericho and along the Dead Sea, which produced, which grew a, a kind of plant called the opo balsam, uh, a balm plant. And this particular balm was only grown in this area between Jericho and kind of En Gedi. And uh, this balm was so expensive on the uh, market in the Roman Empire that Herod was able to raise all kinds of money for his building projects. So, uh, so much so that he was able to pay everyone a salary. He didn't use slaves uh, at all. Everybody had a paycheck um, that built uh, the things that he built. And the main thing that he did um, aside from Masada and all the famous things like uh, the city of Caesarea, which was he built from scratch, he, he rebuilt the temple that had been built, built under Ezra and Nehemiah. Now the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah was a smaller temple. Uh, the actual temple building itself was probably around the same size, but the mount the, uh, the, the platform on which the temple stood was much smaller. And what Herod did was he extended the platform uh, of the temple southward and created the temple mount that we have today, which is around 35 acres. It's a very, very large space. And 
all of us who have been up there together, we know how big it is. And it's the result of Herod the Great and his building project to uh, build the porticos, to, ex to extend the platform, build the porticos, build the wall of partition, upgrade the temple and uh, with renovation and to add uh, different, uh, oh, and the fortress in the Northwest corner of the Temple Mount, the Antonio Fortress. So it was a huge, massive uh, building undertaking with a lot of workers who were, uh, had a paycheck. Um, and at the same time that he was giving everybody a paycheck, he was uh, killing off the people that uh, were opposed to him in any way. And uh, so that was problematic because he killed his wife and he killed his son yeah. because they were of a family that were uh, actually opposed to Herod, opposed to Herod's rule. And uh, they were from the Hasmonean uh, Hasmone dynasty. And as a result, he became jealous and suspicious. And so he had all these uh, emotions. And then of course, you know, when the Magi showed up and said, where is he who is born King of the Jews? Then of course he had all the, the male uh, toddlers <laughs> under two years of age killed, um, hoping that he would do away with this King of the Jews that the Magi were, were coming to visit. So this was the kind of person Herod was. And so the 46 years, let's do some math. He begins building the temple in 20 BC. Uh, he rises to power around 37 BC. And so he starts the temple project around 20 BC. He dies in 4 BC. So he's got about 16 years that he's directly involved with uh, working on the temple. And then it's carried on by his sons. And it's finished right around the time that Jesus enters full-time ministry when he's, you know, 30 years old. Just that's about the timeline. Uh, so the temple, uh, it took 46 years, is finished uh, right around the time that Jesus uh, goes down to Capernaum and begins his ministry. So that's a little bit on the temple. Of course, there's a ton more to talk about the temple. But John, John uh, refers to the temple all the time. It's very important in, in the Gospel of John, uh, much more than the other Gospels. So we have plenty to say about that and also Jerusalem. So it's a very important uh, part. And then, um, Rosemary, let's... Um, uh, read 21 right down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll address that. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone would testify of man, for he knew what was in man. This is so key. Um... We can, we can take it on the level of our own um, selves and understanding our sinful nature, uh, Psalm 51. But I also want to add the dimension here that there was tremendous corruption already in Jerusalem at this time amongst the religious leadership. There was corruption with the priesthood in the temple corruption with the Sadducees and definitely corruption with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, of course, we know they plotted to kill Jesus because uh, they did not want their 
uh, leadership to be undermined in any way by any person who would be coming along uh, claiming to be the Messiah. And they were very paranoid. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, let's see. It says... Um, I lost my thought. Um, yeah, here it is. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs. So he had already done some signs. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how far into his ministry in Galilee he was at the time when uh, John uh, refers here, but um, he had performed some signs that the religious leadership considered to be messianic miracles. Uh, the first one was the healing of the leper. Uh, the second was the uh, healing of the deaf and dumb boy. And those two we know were in Galilee. And then the third was the healing of the man born blind, which John will address. And then, of course, Lazarus, which John will address. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know at this point um, if the religious leadership is getting paranoid enough to be following him around, which we know uh, they did up in Galilee because of these two miracles that he did, um, the deaf and dumb boy and the leper, the healing of the lepers. So uh, they were corrupt and they were paranoid. Mm. <laughs> and so this comment of John um, in verse 24 and 25 to uh, conclude the chapter, um, indicates that he was being very, very careful yeah. and very discreet about what he was doing. And that ends the chapter. And now I want to hear your comments and your questions and your thoughts. <laughs> And I'll get my notebook. Yeah, we're going to, uh, what we're going to do is going to allow you, if you have a question or a comment you want to make, um, just one by one, just unmute and make it. We want to thank you, that fam of us. This is such an in depth and thorough study. It was absolutely incredible. So I must say that. <laughs> thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it was amazing. He's the teacher. It was amazing. Uh, uh, if you have a comment or a question to ask, just unmute yourself and, and speak, and then you can mute yourself and Pamela will answer. Are you all out there? They're all, I see them all. Oh, let me put my view up, I can see them. Hi, Reverend Taylor. Hi, Pamela. Hi, ladies. Hi, Hi Maxine. Hi. Um, just, just an observation, um, going back up to the, the wedding of Cana, I find it interesting that um, the servant had access to the, to the bridegroom to ask him the question about the wine. When you think of today's um, weddings, that sort of thing would have been left to the... Um, to the to the caterers of the wedding rather than bothering the bride or the bridegroom. So I find that quite interesting that the servant had access to the, to, 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 to the bridegroom and wonder at what time that possibly could have been. Yeah, it uh, seems that, um, by the way, that servant, he was like a maitre d' and uh, in Greek, he was the archi, which means the head waiter, the archi 
Klinos. Um, so he was like a maitre d', like you, you would see in a fancy restaurant, someone dressed in a tuxedo. No, he wasn't a normal server. Uh, so he would have access to the bride and groom in that would because he was responsible for the whole feast. And uh, because it was so extraordinary that this happened um, and this uh, maitre d', this head, uh, the head waiter or the uh, master of ceremonies, we could call him, um, he was so shocked that the best wine suddenly shows up after hours of uh, drinking that he has to mention it to the bridegroom. That's my, you know, my thought on it. And uh, it's interesting that you bring that up too, because I suppose in a modern wedding today, the bride and the bridegroom would be totally uh, left out of the whole thing. Thank you, Pamela. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, thank, thanks very much, Pamela, and thank you, Robin Taylor. Um, I just I thought it was very interesting the um, caption when you said about the the servants um, being the people that saw this this miracle. I mean, I, I read it, but I never actually thought about it. And while we, while you were sort of going back and forth, with Reverend Taylor, sort of doing the exclamation marks and the surprise, it actually really put me into the picture because um, when you think about um, like the conference when you're serving, it's that sort of thing. And it's a very good picture that you gave the analogy. But um, I also thought. And just looking at the small group of people that would have been aware of this miracle, it took me back instantly to when the star appeared in the sky to the um, um, the, the shepherds. Yeah. So like they're like obviously like the, the lowest part, not the lowest part, but like sort of not high in society. And then, and yet we know that they're looking after the the lambs that the Passover lambs. But it was just yes. again, it was like. He's, he's showing his, his, his first signs to not people sort of who are sort of high in, in society, but he's showing it to, to people who are not considered sort of highly. And I thought that was really, yeah, very interesting to, to, to see him do that again. Yeah. That's lovely. That's a really, that's a beautiful thought. I'm going to write that down. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a comment or a question? Hello, good afternoon. It's me, Angela. Hi, Angela. All of them. Reverend Taylor and the Pamela. My mind goes back to the, the this this marriage where Jesus was invited. I'm wondering if at any time Jesus being there were the guests expecting any supernatural anything from him because they were so amazed some of them when the water was turned into wine or they just looked at him as some ordinary person uh it says here that it was his first sign so I s sincerely doubt that anybody at the wedding had any kind of expectation. They just probably saw 12 or 13 men showing up and, and uh, the mother, and uh, that's about it. I'm sure, and, and of course they had also been already pretty much uh, feasting away, so. Uh, it just, 
like when you're in a wedding, you see people come in and go out. I, I don't think anybody had any idea this was going to take place. This was a total surprise. It was because I don't think anyone knew that anything was wrong except those who knew the wine had run out. Right. So they, they knew there was a potential catastrophe <laughs> because um, we don't, I don't, there's no suggestion these people are wealthy, they're pretty ordinary people. But when you're having a wedding, you're supposed to have enough money to um, provide for your guests. And I read somewhere in a commentary that if um, you didn't provide enough food or wine, you could be fined. Hmm? Really? So, yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, as far as I was concerned, it was a normal wedding. They must have, they were assuming everything was provided for. Mary was invited, Jesus, her son went, the disciples were there. So I don't think anyone uh, initially thought anything. They were having a good time, enjoying the wine, taste good to them. And they would never have known that the wine was inferior if Jesus hadn't done the miracle. But I believe Mary was the only one that knew. Yes. She might have felt um, embarrassed on, for, the, for the, her friends when she heard the situation. Um, it's possible catastrophe. This, this would be talked about for years to, you know, in the future. So it was, it, was, it was on the brink of total disaster. So I think the only person that could have possibly thought that anyone could save the day would be Mary. Yes. That's why she went to Jesus and told him what happened. And he said, you know, why were you telling me, why are you concerning me about this? My, my time hasn't come. You know, what would it come to me about this? But she knew that if anyone could save the day and the day needed to be saved, it could only be Jesus. And I think that's also why she said, because she knew that he could do anything. I mean, she brought him up, so she knew he could do anything. She knew the prophecies about her son. So here, here is a brink of a, a tragedy. Jesus, we need your help. And she says, that's why she said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because she knew that something out of the normal had to happen because they had no time or perhaps money to go and buy more wine. Something had to happen instantly. And she knew that the only person that had the ability to do something instantly was her son. Yes. And that's why she said, whatever. Because if she didn't tell them that, and he said, what he was going to say, they wouldn't have done it. They would say, this is absurd, this is nonsense. It's water. We, we don't want water, we want wine. But when she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it, she was given instructions that, you know, if they followed, something could possibly happen. But they, but they would have no idea of that at all. But they I, don't think, I don't think she even had an idea what it would be. She no. just had the faith that something would happen. Yeah. She didn't know you would turn water into wine. She wouldn't know that. But what I do believe she knew is that he could save the day. But she didn't know how. <laughs> I love it. Uh, just reading it uh, again. Uh, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And it's just a, a couple of words in verse three. And when they ran out of wine, <laughs> so the they, the they are the servants, the whole, the, the, the people that were going to be affected by this miracle. It's amazing. I mean, I, I'm beginning to even sense the panic that they were in um, with this running out of wine. And so <laughs> his mother and of course, you know, uh, it, it take a, it, it requires a woman to notice these things. Yeah. To notice this detail, to yeah. first of all to to discern the panic in the servants and to go and maybe ask, and so you know it take it it took her to get to sort of uh, infiltrate the servants' circle of panic to yeah. find out what's going on. 
because usually, you know, you when you're serving, you want to keep all the, the the serving problems and the cooking and everything. You don't want it to be revealed to the people you're serving. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. But ladies, I have to uh, thank you so much. Yeah. I've just got a, a note saying that um, the, the men are having a meeting at six o'clock. Okay. So we have to wind this up. But Great. wonderful um, comments and, and questions. Um, and we just love our time together, just taking time out um, almost two hours to be in the word. Mm. And, um, mm. and Pamela, we thank God for the gift that God's given to you, that you are able to, um, to teach and to sustain and keep our interest and uh, <laughs> give us such broad information going to the Old Testament and, and it, was, it was lovely to, to get that clarity on the transition from the, the people being called Hebrews coming through to Israel to Jews. That, that's, it, was, it was very clear. Oh, good. I didn't find that confusing at all. It was, it was very oh, good. Oh, thank you. Transition. Um, and so <laughs> many times people wonder, you know, um, when, when were they is, Israelites? When were they, um, when were the Hebrews? It, it can get confusing in that way, but you show the transition. I thought that was wonderful and many, many other things. Thank but um, ladies, I'm going to close in prayer and then we're going to take a few minutes to say hi, goodbye, greet each other. So that they, there's enough time for them to begin their next meeting. Pamela. Love you even more. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all ladies for sacrificing um, your Saturday afternoon. It's lovely to see so many people on 54 women. Wonderful. I mean, know how busy women can be. So to sacrifice to um, be here on, on a Saturday, God richly, richly bless you. Lord, I want to thank you so much for this rich time we've had. It's been really like feasting on the word. Thank you so much for your daughter, for your servant who you have brought to the kingdom for such a time as this, to be able to bring forth your truths. We have enjoyed every moment and we look forward to going back over our notes and in these scriptures again, to just to think that in one chapter, so much came out. We thank you so much for your servant, John, that this could be recorded, that we could have time to go through this word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the desire you place within us to hunger and to thirst after righteousness and to, to want to eat of your word. Thank you for touching our minds and unfolding your truths. Continue to take us deeper still, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On mute, greet each other. And until we okay. meet again. Bye. 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 Until we meet again. Bye. 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 Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Mim and Tyler. Bye. Thank you, Pamela. Bye. So much. Bye. 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 Hi, Julie. Hi, Julia. 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 Hi,